this is my timekeeping presentation. I actually gave this at ELC two weeks ago, so it'll probably be online. You can probably watch that one, or you can watch this one. This one's going to be 20 minutes long, though, so this will be the accelerated version. So uh, people always ask me why I had been doing this presentation. Uh, and the answer is that some time ago I made some changes to the timekeeping area and then people found some, some crashes in there inside the company and they asked me what's wrong and I said I don't really know what's wrong but I can explain to you how it works. And so they basically said, oh, that'd be great, let's make a presentation. So I made a presentation. So in the beginning, there was a counter and the counter incremented. In this example, I don't know what I've set it up to do, but it just keeps counting up. Sometimes there's counters that count down. And uh, this is basically what you get when you have to do timekeeping in hardware. You have something that's counting. Now, if you have a counter, you're going to calculate the passage of time. So to calculate the passage of time, it's just uh, some math. It's pretty simple. It's just you take the cycles and you divide it by the frequency of the counter. And and then you figure out how many seconds or nanoseconds you want. The only thing is that if you want to implement this in the kernel, there's a few problems. The problems are that the you know, division is slow on CPUs usually. And we can't really do floating point math in the kernel, even though we can in some places, but we're not going to use that in the timekeeping area. And we have, might have some precision and overflow issues with this. Because, you know, maybe if you're doing integer math, you can't just divide and then you lose all the precision. So let's see how we can make this a little bit faster. So we can do this kind of a mult shift operation. And the function that we use in the kernel here is called clock source psych 2 ns, which takes this mult shift value and then tells you how many nanoseconds a cycle count is. So the question is, where does this mult shift come from? Uh, the mult shift usually is calculated by this function called clock's calc mult shift. Uh, it, it is, it's a function that you pass in these arguments to and it returns the, the multi shift values. So the multi is much cheaper than doing this division and the shift also is cheaper than doing the division because it's just a division by power of two. And also this avoids all the floating point issues that we talked about earlier and the only problem with this, right, is that we have a conversion range that's slightly limited to what we want to, what we can convert because of the multi shift values. So the you see in the clock cock mode shift argument, there's a, there's a Mac, there's this min sec, I don't know if I can show it, min sec, that's actually the, the range of seconds that we were willing to convert with this mode shift value. That is, is, is going to work. So wrapping this all together, we need to abstract the hardware. So what we do is we have this uh, struct clock source that basically has a function called read that lets you read the hardware counter and then has, it stores these mul shift values and also some other things. And uh, the functions that we use to register them are these clock source, register hertz, kill hertz, those to do the, clock, the mul shift calculations internally and assign them to the mul shift values in the structure. And, and that's pretty much it, right? It's pretty simple. You can see this, uh, I put a little example of the, how, to calculate, how we calculate time differences. So that's all great and fine, but then how do we actually implement timekeeping on top of this? So just a little refresher. These are the positive clocks that we have for timekeeping. Uh, I'm not going to go through all of them, but basically you, you, there's, uh, there's different kinds. There's monotonic, which is always increasing, and then there's these things that are the raw, raw and coarse, so these two extra specifiers. So raw means that there's no NTP adjustments at the time. And coarse is pretty much the same as, the, as, mon as monotonic, but it, uh, it doesn't include the time since the jiffies, so it's, it's like the resolution is it's much less. It's much less than nanosecond resolution. It depends on whatever your jiffies resolution is. And, and, and of course, real time, whatever. These are all clocks that we support, and you can read about these in your man pages. So I made a little, try and make a little comparison of these different clocks. So in boot time, it's always going on, but you saw that when we suspended, monotonic kind of stopped. In real time, if we, if we do a set time of day or something, we can adjust the real-time clock and it may go back or forwards. But overall, you know, boot time is consistently continuing and monotonic just doesn't count the time that we are in suspend. So how do we implement this? 
I, I like to think of it as uh, we implemented by doing this thing called read accumulate track or RAT, the best acronym I could come up with. So the way we do it is we read the clock source, we accumulate the time that we since we last read it, and we track the last last timestamp we read from the clock source, so that we can keep accumulating time into this. Basically, it's a nanosecond accumulator. So if you look in the code to how we implement this, we uh, basically we have this thing called TK rebase inside the timekeeping, which lets us read the clock source, and then we we I can't see myself from my body. The uh, then we read the um, the time here with TKR read, and then we track the last time we had the cycle, and we calculate how much time with this timekeeping get analysis function. Similarly, for accumulating and tracking, we accumulate into this uh, monocycle lap, or we accumulate into the X time NSEC and other accumulators. Like there's a couple of accumulators in the timekeeping code, and we. We keep tracking what the last time we read in this logarithmic accumulation function. We track the last cycle that we, we counted. These are just some of the places, I highlighted some of the places where this accumulation and tracking is happening. I'm do that. So, in the end, we still need to implement all uh, the different types of clocks, but we only have one physical counter that's counting up, so we need to have some kind of way to do that. And by the way, by the, how we do that is we accumulate time into this TKR mono base area, and then we add in offsets this way, like offset real, offset boot, to, and then we add in the time we read since we last read the cycles from the, we read the counter, and we compare that to, we subtract that from the time we last calculated these offsets, or, hold on. We read the mono base, we add in the off this offset, and then we also add in the, basically the time since we last read the, count, the clock source. And then that basically gives us one of these three different or four different types of POSIX clocks. So I try to show that here in this diagram at the bottom, which I, I guess you can probably read. But it's just a bunch of additions. And then the mult shift is hidden in that read clock source box. That, but that mult shift, or the read clock source part is just going to be doing the, the very small time calculation typically. So how do we take care of uh, clock drift? Because our hardware is never really perfect, right? The hardware may be programmed to be 19.2 megahertz, but it actually is 19.2 and 8 hertz extra. So you see that, you know, technically it's not exactly the same amount of time that's passed. And after a th hundred thousand cycles, oh no, we've lost two nanoseconds, right? So this is what NTP is for. But the way we do it in the kernel is we use the molt value in the molt shift to basically multiply it with a slightly different frequency so that we can calculate a slightly different number. So when the NTP adjustment comes in, it ba all it's really doing is, is modifying this molt value and that takes care of the NTP adjustment. That's a very simplified version of what, how it works, but from the kernel's perspective, it's really just, just pretty much all it's doing. It's just modifying the frequency that we see and adjusting it for everyone who reads. Also, in the kernel, we have uh, things to make this fast and efficient. So people have wanted to read the timekeeping from anywhere. They want to read the timekeeping, the, the time from inside NMI context, and that basically cannot take any locks. So what we've done is uh, there's been changes to make uh, this TK core structure and this TK fast structure, which lets us read the time without having to take any locks besides this sequence. So it's kind of like this poor man's RCU design where we ca have two copies of the time. And when we read one, we can read, we can read the other as long as we, s we do a mem copy operation when we're updating it. And and you can look at this code for this, but it's, it's all basically constructed to fit inside one cache line so we don't make any cache hits when we're updating and when we're reading. And, uh, and, uh, and there's lots of code in the, in the timekeeping that basically does this, this update and, and modifies the seek value. So, so this is kind of like a pattern that's actually kind of emerging in the kernel. I think it's, it's in a couple other places, but this is what you do when you have to read, when you have to do some kind of timekeeping read without having to take any locks. 
try to go as fast as I can. So a little note about this is that the, when we when we have timekeeping, we also adjust the right. We do the multi adjustment for NTP, and and if we're not taking any locks, that basically we need to update the timekeeping's molten value, and that will change the frequency. So if someone's reading it in an NMI context, and we're also adjusting the the value of the, of the frequency, basically changing the molten molt value, the time may look like it went backwards or or forwards, depending on what we're doing. And and that it may look different depending on the read order. So maybe we'll, there's one CPU who's reading it, and then there's NMI, and then there's another CPU that's reading it after that. They may see time go back and forth, and they basically have to accept this fact because we can't do anything better than this. But the, I mean, that's basically as good as it's going to get. So I, there's a there's a diagram in the kernel, but this is kind of a similar diagram. It basically, just shows that this is how this is how it would go bad. So overall, this is where we are and uh, what we described. We have monotonic real time. All these different clocks are going into this struct TK core, and that's reading this monotonic base, which is going to read the clock source, which is going to finally read the hardware counter. So, what do we do if uh, your system doesn't actually have a physical counter? Well, if that's true, I don't, it's not really actually true, but it's pretty bad actually. You can't use no hertz, you can't use HR timers in high resolution mode, and pretty much you only can do this GFE's clock source. So, I haven't really talked about Jiffy so far, but we can talk about it now. So Jiffy is just one over this config hertz, and it's always updating during the tick, and it's not that tick. So the tick is this uh, periodic event that's updating all this stuff. It's updating the timekeeping core, it's updating the Jiffy's value, it's doing process accounting, global hold accounting, it's doing all these things, right? But not everything is done every Jiffy. Some things are done depending on uh, different things we'll see, we'll talk about a little bit later. For example, like HR timer is not always done every Jiffy. Things like IRQ works not done every Jiffy, but they could be. It depends on how the system is configured. Also, another thing to note that during the tick, right, we're updating Jiffy's, and that's an interrupt usually, right? It's always this actually. So, if the CPU can't receive interrupts, Jiffy's is not going to increment. So, people need to keep that in mind when they're talking about Jiffy's, right? It's not always going to be moving forward. At least right now, that's how that's the way it works. So if we, if we need to implement the tick in hardware, we need to have a, a thing called a, a timer. So I try to show an example here of a hardware timer value that's kind of incrementing up. It could be incrementing down. It could count to zero. But this one's basically a timer that has a match value that you can program. So every time the I think this one's programmed like hex 20 or 20 or something. So every 20 20 ticks, we can have the or every 20 cycles we'll have the tick fire. So we want to abstract this. We have the structure called clock event device, which has all these fields and all these features. So as you see, the the, has a, the the important thing in the clock event device is this event handler. That's pretty much the function that we call when some event when, when the timer fires. And then uh, we have these different features that are periodic, one shot, and K time. The periodic is, is basically says my clock event can raise and interrupt every one over config hertz seconds. And then one shot means I can raise and interrupt whenever you've program, programmed the next event to fire through the set next event function. And you also see that there's a mult shift value here too. So that's the way we can convert the time in nanoseconds back to cycles. So it's, a, it's basically the reverse conversion that we do for the clock sources. But this time we do it uh, the other way. And usually you'll see people calling this function called clock, config, clock events configure register. That's how we register these abstractions. So there's, uh, there's three different event handlers. There's technically more, but there's three main event handlers. So the, there's the uh, default one, which is the periodic one. There's the low res version, which is the no hertz handler. And there's the high res version, which is the HR timer interrupt. So we'll go through all these in examples. So in the periodic mode, uh, basically you, you said that you're going to fire, uh, you're going to have an interrupt, you run the tick every, every config hertz cycles. And this event handler is going to be called tick handle periodic. And basically, you know, a task may run and then the tick will fire and the task may run and then idle may happen and then the tick will fire. And those will just continue. Nothing will be turned off, nothing will happen. Now, if we have uh, the config no hertz idle, and we're using the techno hertz handler, then we can have idle actually go for longer than one tick and not have it interrupted. 
So in this example, you'll see that compared to the periodic mode, the idle one is only, is the idle and the no hertz handler can go the entire length. Now this is still not a uh, high resolution mode. So in high resolution mode, everything becomes an HR timer and the, well, the tip becomes an HR timer. It's similar to low res mode, but in this case, we can have idle run as long as it needs to and tasks can, and the tick is running as well as this red box. And HR timers can also run in the middle anywhere they want. In the middle of a task, right, the HR timer can fire and run the HR timer. So for, I'm really running out of time to go faster. So to, to implement this in the code, we actually put a layer on top of clock events called tick devices. So there, there can be way more clock events than we have for CPUs, so we make this structure tick device that pretty much just is a clock event device and also a mode. And it's per CPU because we need to have the tick run in every, every CPU to do time slicing. And so, so we have this wrapper structure that exists. And you'll notice that there's a mode here, but it's, it looks very similar to the clock, clock event mode, but it's slightly different. So in here, the periodic mode basically says that we're gonna call tick periodic every jiffy, and, and the one-shot mode means we're gonna we're gonna configure our clock event to run in some kind of high res or low res, one, uh, no hertz mode. So for running the tick, uh, we're gonna make this tick sketch structure on top and that's gonna have the sked timer for an HR timer and either way we're gonna call, there's gonna be a hardware event that's gonna fire an interrupt and that's gonna call into the clock event code, which is going to finally going to call the event handler, which is going to either call one of these three different event handlers that we already talked about, and then that's going to either, if it's HR timer interrupt, it's going to run HR timers. If it's the no hertz handler, it's going to call run tick, or it's going to run the tick part. And then the HR timers are also going to run uh, other HR timers, which we'll talk about in a, in a second. And, and then finally, we're going to re, re, restart the the next event or the next tick by either doing the periodic emulation from tick handle periodic or we're gonna call into the tick device and then come back to the, to the clock event and reprogram the hardware to, to fire and interrupt again. And this is all happening on every CPU, so just a note that this is not one CPU that's doing this, this is happening every single CPU. So if we're gonna stop the tick, it's not always as simple as just saying, hey, I'm gonna cancel this HR timer. It could be that we actually need to restart it sometime so, so far in the future. Depends on how, what we need to do. And this, kind, this code needs to consider all different kinds of things, like if we need to run a timer, if we need to run an HR timer. I basically listed all the things, most of the things out. And all the details you can see in this, let's see, no hurt, stop, kid tick. Okay, so we can stop the timer, or we can stop the tick, and that's basically how we implement no hurts. But if we have this thing called tick broadcast for the cases where we can't even start the, the timer to run because when we go idle, maybe we'll lose the hardware, the, the, uh, hardware event because maybe it's emitted into the power, in the power domain of that, of that CPU or something or is basically that's usually how it is. So when the hardware event doesn't work, we have this tick, tick broadcast mechanism that's basically a global clock event that's on the side, that's not a per CPU version, which has its own event handlers, which either calls this tick handle periodic broadcast or tick handle one shot broadcast. And that will call into this function called tick do broadcast, which then will basically send an IPI or send some kind of cross calling to others, all the other CPUs that are dead, in this, in this example, CPU one and CPU two, to finally call into, into those clock events to, to then call their event handlers that they're supposed to call. So this is how we, we emulate in cases when we go into some kind of low power idle state. So finally, if we need to implement timers on top of all this, we have the same kind of design that we've seen before. We have the hardware event called the clock event, and that finally calls into the event handler. And the thing that happens is that it runs, if it runs the tick, and that raises a soft IRQ to run the, the timers. And the tick, when it runs, it also updates the jiffies so that the timer wheel can keep moving forward. So basically, the, this is like the, the cycle that continues. But timers only really rely on the fact that we have jiffies incrementing and some kind of clock event and soft IRQ. So they don't actually care about this high resolution mode, which is only handled in the two top, in this example, only handled by the two top event handlers, which we're going to cover now. 
So an HR timer is just very similar, right? Everything is still flowing out of this hardware event where it raises and interrupts and calls the event handler. The difference is that you have to be in these top two or in these top two boxes to run run HR timers. So if you're the no hertz handler, we run the tick, and then from the from there we run the HR timers. Versus when it's the HR timer interrupt, we run the HR timers, and then we run the tick calculations happen from an HR timer callback, which is the tick skip. So it's very similar. The only difference is that we we call from the tick uh, from the tick handling code in the low resolution mode version directly to the HR timer code, versus not doing that. So this just tries to show the sequence of events that happen. So in summary, uh, we've covered lots of things as quickly as I could in the time I had, and. Uh, what was slightly difficult, right, is that timekeeping keeping has to always take care of these NTP and drift issues. Those are pretty much the most difficult pieces of the timekeeping code. And the tick is using lots of layers of abstraction, as you notice. It goes through lots of different pieces. And no hertz gets really complicated making when we have to start and stop it. And that function is actually quite long, but it's pretty well documented. And uh, the, the broadcast mechanism makes all the no hertz stuff actually even more complicated. So. Overall, it's, it's, it's fairly complicated when you look in the code, but it's, it's fairly well written and it's pretty solid stuff. So with that, I think that's all the time I got, actually. Right, so thanks, everyone, for coming. And if you have any questions, I'm sure I can possibly answer. <laughs>